Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us as Sierra Week 2021 kicks off today for this event with advocates, experts, and frontline leaders to highlight why voluntary commitments made by some oil and gas companies to cut methane have, have been and continue to be insufficient and urge oil and gas companies attending the conference to support federal safeguards to tackle the growing methane pollution and climate crises. Joining us for this event today is Patrice Tomchik, an oil and gas specialist with Moms Clean Air Force, Lisa DeVille, the Vice Chair of Fort Burt Hold Power, Sharon Wilson, a certified optical gas imaging thermographer with Earthworks, Leslie Fleischman, Senior Analyst with Clean Air Task Force, and Josh Eisenfeld, a Corporate Accountability Communications Campaigner with Earthworks. We will start with remarks from our speakers and we'll conclude with a question and answer period. With that, I will now turn it over to our first speaker, Patrice Tomchek with Moms Clean Air Force. Patrice, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. And um, hello, and thank you all for attending today. My name is Patrice Tomchek, and I'm the mother of two boys. I live in Southwest, what, Southwest Pennsylvania on top of uh, the Marcella Shell. I'm a national field manager and oil and gas specialist for Moms Clean Air Force a community of over 1 million moms and dads united nationwide against air pollution and climate change um, to protect our children's health. We envision a safe and stable future where all children breathe clean air. My children go to school near unconventional gas wells <clears throat> located approximately a half a mile away from their school campus. And I know that oil and gas operations emit harmful methane and volatile organic compounds. And I'm really concerned about what harmful air pollutants my children may be exposed to from these gas wells when they attend school or they play outdoor sports and um, especially my youngest who is immune compromised. Uh, while we're all vulnerable to air pollution and climate change, certain populations are affected more such as children, those with underlying medical conditions, low income communities, as well as black, brown and indigenous people. And those who live the closest are impacted the most. I know that in the US, 12.6 million people live within a half mile of oil and gas operations and 2.9 million children go to school within a half mile of oil and gas operations. And this puts their health at risk. Methane and VOC pollution from the oil and gas industry can cause respiratory diseases, asthma attacks, preterm birth, low birth weight, cancer, and more. In addition, climate change poses many threats to public health that families across the nation are experiencing today from extreme weather, increased flooding, more wildfires that can cause injury, respiratory problems, asthma attacks, and more. As a mom, I know there's no time to waste. Our children need real and meaningful action to protect them now. Cutting methane pollution from new and existing sources of oil and gas operations is one of the quickest and low cost ways for the US to reduce climate warming greenhouse gases, improve air quality and protect public health. Cutting methane is supported by the public, investors and oil and gas industry. If the industry is serious about confronting climate change, they must work with the Biden administration to cut methane pollution 65% below 2012 levels by 2025. This is an achievable target that can be met by enforcing the full powers of the Clean Air Act and using proven existing tools. All children have the right to breathe clean air. We all need to work together so that they will have a healthy and safe future. Mom's Clean Air Force will fight for justice in every breath. And now I'd like to turn it over to Lisa DeVille the Vice Chair of Fort Berthold Power. Lisa. Lisa, I think you might be on mute. Okay, hello, I'm here, sorry. <laughs> I check out my grandbabies, okay. Uh, thank you, Patrice, for the introduction. But I'm also an enrolled citizen of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Rikwa Nation. I and my family are life lifelong residents of Mandri on Fort Berthold Reservation in um, North Dakota. 
is where we live in the front lines of oil and gas in the Bakken oil field. I'm co-creator of the grassroots group for Berthold Protectors of Water and Earth Rights. The impacts on the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Rikura people are real and damaging. From semi-truck crashes to brine spills to invisible spills such as methane, unchecked development is killing our people. The teachings of my grandmother is that our identity as indigenous people is the land, air, and water. Mother Earth, hold on, sorry. The teachings of my grandmother is that our identity as indigenous people is the land, air, and water. We destroy Mother Earth, we destroy ourselves. Mother Earth is sick. When she is sick, we're sick. I live less than a mile away from well pads that flare, one mile from a facility that produces stores and transports natural gas. And in August of 2017, my husband and I became ill with a respiratory infection. When our infections did not respond to the medications prescribed to us by doctors in our local branch of Indian Health Service, we went to McKenzie County Clinic where a physician told us that we had the same symptoms as oil field workers. They had, treated at, they had treated at the clinic. I was prescribed more medication and my husband received a steroid injection, but it took us another eight weeks for us to fully recover. We were miserable during those eight weeks and we live in a constant fear of next devastating illness caused by exposure to heavily polluted air. I was approached by Manny school staff that many children have bloody noses daily. Asthma is on the rise on Fort Berthold Reservation. Covert promises don't mean anything. They have, haven't for decades. They've promised time and time again that they would do it right and no damage would be done. The bottom line is this. We know that methane pollution from the oil and gas industry is, a, is fueling the climate crisis. And we have the tools and the technology to do something about it. They've cheated our people and family out of responsible development and royalties. Time and time, these corporations have proven that they will fail to meet their own voluntary goals and only do the bare minim minimum of what is required of them. In Manry, we had 23 spills in one year. That was kept hidden from the Manry people. North Dakota has gas capture goals that companies have agreed to with rare, rare consequences. In November, the voluntary statewide goal was 9% of all gas would be vented, flared, or leaked. The goal is that one in 10 MCF of gas is wasted and put in our lungs. They've had decades to innovate and comply with the state goals, but have definitely failed at the expense of the Mandan and Hidatsa and Rikura people. Even if these corporations met their voluntary state goal, which would be 8 billion cubic feet of non-renewable gas, vented leak or flared per month. We need strong federal rules now. Even if the tribe did everything right and had strictest rules, 5,000 or sorry, 2,523 wells are producing within the reservation boundaries. And we are surrounded by thousands more. Development and air surrounding reservations will continue to damage our health and climate. Federal government has trust responsibility and they're failing. Enforcement will be, will be the most important. Federal EPA needs to be here in North Dakota to protect the Mandan and Hidatsa people, Rikura people. In closing, the only corporate promise we want to hear is every company of the Sierra Weeks supporting the Biden administration's strong nationwide methane rules now. If the industry is serious about confronting climate change, they will work with the administration to cut methane pollution by 65% below the 2012 levels by 2025. An achievable target that can be met a, at a low cost by enforcing the full powers of the Clean Air Act. Um, next to speak is Sharon Wilson. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. I'm Sharon Wilson. I'm senior field advocate and optical gas imaging thermographer for Earthworks. I moved to 42 acres in Wise County in 1995, and that's where George Mitchell was experimenting until he learned how to produce oil and gas from shale by fracking. I watched the rigs move closer and closer to where I lived until I was surrounded and my air turned brown and eventually my water turned black. The industry has been making promises about containing their methane 
since way back then, well over a decade. I started helping other people whose health was impacted when oil and gas moved to their backyards. The industry continued to deny that their pollution was at fault. I went to work for Earthworks, but I had to leave my home in the country to protect my son from breathing pollution. That's when Earthworks brought, bought an optical gas imaging camera and I took the training to become a certified thermographer. I was certified in June, 2014. I've spent over a decade trying to get Texas to regulate oil and gas. Even when I send them optical gas imaging videos as evidence that they can see with their own eyes, they protect the industry, not people, not the climate. The industry is still not containing their methane and now I can prove it. I have some slides to show you. This first slide is um, of a vapor recovery unit malfunction that lasted for months. Uh, I used to believe that vapor recovery units were the holy grail of methane emissions, but now I see that they're one of the pieces of equipment that fails quite often in the oil and gas patch. Um, next slide. There was no violation found for this event. Next slide, please. This is a small compressor on a well site and it's having a blowdown. They have blowdowns for emergencies and maintenance. Um, if you can imagine this event coming from a compressor that is two stories high and five, 10 compressors on one site, it's pretty, that's what happens at a compressor, a compressor station. Next slide, please. <clears throat> These are pressure releases. Pressure releases are required to keep equipment from blowing up. Um, despite industry promises, currently the technology to prevent pressure releases does not exist. They can use vapor recovery units, but I just showed you what that looks like. So next slide, please. This is an unlit flare. And unlit flares are quite common in the oil and gas patch. For some reason, industry cannot seem to keep their flares lit. And sometimes they don't, it's intentional. And I know that because when they see me coming, they rush and try to light their flares before I can catch them. The Biden administration <clears throat> should declare climate change a national emergency and use those expanded powers that it provides. At a minimum, the administration needs to use the full force of the Clean Air Act to reduce methane by 65%, which is not enough. And it's pretty clear to me that it's not possible. While we continue to uh, to grant new permits to the oil and gas industry. Methane will continue to rise in our atmosphere until we stop permitting new oil and gas facilities and infrastructure. In Texas, where I live, and where the politics are controlled by climate deniers, whose minds will not be changed by more information, for, for any of this to be effective, the EPA needs to revoke Texas's clean air Texas's implementation of the Clean Air Act. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Leslie Fleischman, Senior Analyst for Clean Air Task Force. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Shannon. I have a few slides. Um, so next slide. There's clearly momentum to move forward on strong methane regulations. In the past several years, a number of U.S. states 
have put in place standards to reduce methane emissions from the oil and gas industry. This momentum continues um, as Pennsylvania is advancing rules for its industry. New Mexico issued flaring waste rules and will soon have air emission rules in place. And just a few weeks ago, Colorado issued important rules requiring operators to eliminate emissions from many pneumatic controllers in that state. In addition, Canada and Mexico have strong methane regulations that cover both new and existing oil and gas sources in those countries. However, in many large oil and gas states, state level methane regulations are not on the horizon. So federal rules are needed. Next slide. In order to protect the health of lo local communities and the climate, the EPA should very rapidly put in place methane emission standards at new and existing oil and natural gas sites nationwide. Using currently available technology, regulations can readily reduce methane emissions in 2025 from oil and gas to 65% below 2012 levels. These regulations will reduce methane emissions by more than 7 million metric tons, equivalent to 640 million metric tons CO2 equivalent. The details of this 65% proposal can be found at this URL here, and I will summarize that um, in the rest of my presentation. Uh, next slide. Methane emissions are projected to be nearly 12 million metric tons um, in 2025 under current policies. We estimate this by scaling em current emissions based on future production product projections and incorporating the results of peer-reviewed science uh, that has synthesized measurements from hundreds of well pads and multiple aircraft studies. These baseline emissions in 2025 are the same as 260 coal-fired power plants. Uh, next. We can reduce these emissions by nearly 4.5 million metric tons first by using monthly leak detection and repair inspections or other continuous uh, leak monitoring programs. This addresses everything from simple leaking components such as valves, but also super emitters, the infrequent but large emissions events that arise in some improper conditions at oil and gas sites. Leaks and super emitters together amount to about half of the total emissions from the oil and gas industry. Uh, many states require LDAR leak detection and repair and leading states like Colorado keep making it more and more frequent. So given the large magnitude of leak emissions, uh, monthly leak detection and repair is appropriate. Next slide. The next largest opportunity to reduce methane emissions is from pneumatic equipment at oil and gas sites. These devices, which are ubiqui ubiquitous at oil and gas sites in the US, are designed, to reduce, or are designed to release gas into the air when operating. And they often vent and leak far more than they were designed to. By replacing this natural gas driven equipment with non-emitting alternatives, we can reduce 2025 emissions by 2.4 million metric and a rule recently finalized in Colorado requires a substantial chunk of sites to be retrofitted to eliminate emitting pneumatic controllers. Next slide. The final bar shows reductions um, from the remaining parts of the 65% proposal uh, and more details can be found in our detailed memo and I'll share the link to that again at the end of my presentation. Next. Uh, total reductions from the, these measures would have an enormous climate benefit, reducing methane emissions by almost 8 million metric tons a year, which has near-term climate benefits similar to replacing 150 million gasoline cars with cars powered by zero carbon electricity. This is a huge benefit. Now, stepping back at the upcoming White House Climate Summit, methane needs to be on the agenda. The U.S. needs to announce quantitative economy-wide methane reductions as part of its nationally determined contribution in line with the goals of the Paris Agreement and commit to actively working with other countries to address this issue globally. This is especially important as the EU is moving forward with implementation of its methane strategy with plans to reduce, reduce methane from domestic production as well as imports. 
the EU is signaling that they are disinterested in buying gas that has a huge upstream footprint. As a first step, oil and gas companies that care about climate change need to support strong methane standards in the US, in the EU, and elsewhere, in line with a 65% or greater emission reduction by 2025. And now I'll turn it over to Josh Eisenfeld with Earthworks. Thank you very much, Leslie. And as she said, I'm Josh Eisenfeld. I am the Corporate Accountability Communications Campaigner at Earthworks. In recent years, Zero Week has become a place for companies to advertise their climate credentials, specifically voluntary climate commitments they have made to maintain their credibility. But the oil and gas industry has shown it cannot be trusted. Through its spending on the expansion of pollution sources, spending on anti-climate lobbying, and perpetual failure to actually cut methane pollution. We know that methane pollution is a major climate problem for the oil and gas industry. Since the start of the fracking boom, methane pollution has grown at an alarming rate. Companies like Shell, BP, and ExxonMobil claim that they are in line with the Paris agreements, but at the same time, they're paying tens of million dollars to the American Petroleum Institute to push back on the Biden administration for already going too far. Companies wanna have their cake and eat it too. That's dishonest and it's dangerous. Earthworks has spent three years tracking misinformation and ground truthing industry promises to voluntarily cut methane. In the methane misinformation scorecard released in December, 2020, we show that one, the oil and gas industry is worsening the climate crisis. Two, the science shows that methane is skyrocketing and oil and gas fracking is to blame. And three, that the climate that the climate commitments so far have only revealed climate hypocrisy. In the meantime, people on the ground are the ones suffering. We heard from Lisa how indigenous communities are being treated like sacrifice zones. And from Sharon about how production sites aren't being properly monitored and allowing unaccounted pollution into the atmosphere. And from Patrice, who showed us how children are being exposed to this unnecessary pollution. The problem and its consequences are clear. Fortunately, Leslie Fleischman of the Clean Air Task Force laid out a significant step forward to a solution and a shovel-ready plan to use the Clean Air Act to this fullest extent of the law to cut methane emissions by 65% in the next five years. And oil and gas is, companies are well aware of this possibility. Some are making bold commitments to change, some are standing their ground, but none of them are doing enough. It's their actions that matter and not their words. The oil and gas industry has repeatedly proven that it cannot be trusted. For decades, they have operated on a business model of delaying the public's awareness of risk, which has undermined both our economic stability and our chances to take real action on climate. The UN just released a report calling on governments to to go bigger and bolder. If these companies are serious about acting on climate and acting in accordance, in accordance with the Paris agreements, as many of their annual reports say, they should support going bigger on climate. And they can do that by supporting our shovel-ready plan to cut methane emissions by 65% in the next five years. That should be the floor for any company that is serious about tackling the climate crisis. Thank you, uh, and I'll send it back to Lauren, um, who will take questions, I think. Hey, Josh, this is Kelly. I'm gonna jump in here. Uh, thank you for joining us on Zoom and on Facebook Live today, and thank you to our panelists. If you are watching on Zoom this, this afternoon and would like to ask a question, please go ahead and enter that question into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And if you're watching us on Facebook Live today uh, and have a question for any of our panelists, please go ahead and pop that question into the comments on the live stream and we will be monitoring there for questions as well. So again, if you're on Zoom, please go ahead and use the chat box to enter your question. And if you're on Facebook Live, you can just leave a question for our panelists as a comment on the live stream of the video. We do have one question coming in, and this question is for Leslie. 
the question asks, 60, a 65% reduction in methane emissions sounds like a pretty ambitious number. You say it's reasonable. Can you elaborate a little bit more on why that isn't as crazy a target as it may sound? Sure, thank you for the question. We lay out the details of the 65% reduction in the memo, and I can drop a link to the memo in the chat on the Zoom. Um, all of the measures that we included, are, uh, there are precedents for them at the state level or at, in other countries. So all of the, all the components of the 65% plan are things that can be done, have already been done, and where the technologies are available um, to move forward with them. Thank you, Leslie. Um, we did have another question coming in on the Facebook live stream, and this question is not directed at anyone in particular, so folks should feel free to weigh in. This question comes from Robin Down, and the question asks, how do we fight back against methane pollution from the oil and gas industry? Does anyone want to jump in on that? Sure, I can. Uh, it's Patrice Tomczak from Moms Clean Air Force. And so there are many ways to um, fight back for, uh, and protect communities and uh, the climate. And one way is to um, join up with organizations such as the organizations on this particular um, uh, press conference. But also what's most important is that our elected officials here. So we wanna make sure that our um, representatives and senators are hearing from uh, people that they care about this issue and that they want to have, that they are holding um, uh, industry accountable for their pollution. And also that they want uh, to be able to uh, cut methane uh, in order to protect health and climate change. So uh, letting the uh, your elected officials hear about it um, from you in your story is most powerful. Thanks, Patrice. We do have a couple of questions coming in from folks who are joining us on Zoom. So I'm going to start with the following Lauren? question. Lauren? Hello. Hi, Lisa. I'd like to add to that um, what Jish just commented on. I think sure. it's very important to also create laws, enforce those laws, also do studies to back up um, like what Earthworks does because um, they've done a lot of work here on Fort Berthold for us. They have proven the toxic or our invisible spill that's here off these flares and every which way you look here in, um, on Fort Berthold. Um, I always use this story because it's like we're lit up. Um, at night, we're lit up like it's still day. So our flaring here is pretty bad, but also anal research analysis, um, that data is very important to also press the, um, the government on um, creating those laws. Thanks, Lisa. I, I appreciate you jumping in there. Um, I am gonna move to this question from Jen, Jennifer Dewey at Bloomberg. The question asks, what do we know about the willingness of the Biden administration to lay out a specific methane reduction target as part of the US and DC? And to what extent are other countries signaling that they'll make part that part of their next pledges? Does anyone on the panel wanna jump in here? Um, so I, I, can, I can start at least. Um, we know we, we're seeing that around the world, more and more countries are uh, interested in including methane reductions in their NDCs. Um, this is because methane reductions are some of the lowest cost, low hanging fruit um, climate reductions. Um, so it just makes sense to include those as part of the NDCs. Um, and for the US uh, Clean Air Task Force and, and our uh, partner groups will be pushing as hard as we can to make sure that the Biden administration includes methane reductions in the NDC. And, and I'll just add um, that I think there are, you know, the signals that we're seeing are you know on day one the Biden administration um, 
set forth an executive order that required the EPA come up with new rules for the existing and, and um, new sources by September. So I think that's a, a big signal that this is going to be part of the overall methane reduction plan. And I expect to see methane reduction, methane targets in the NDC come April. Can I just jump in and say that uh, methane rules are great but enforcement of those rules is a different matter. And that is going to be super difficult. It will take a lot, it's, it will take an army really to enforce those rules. And um, it's kind of late to set that system up now. So I'm going to say that even with, with a 65% reduction, there will still be methane in our atmosphere will continue to grow until we stop permitting oil and gas wells. Thank you all for weighing in there. And we do have another question coming in. This question comes from Carlos and Chondo at e and &E. What do you all make of the difference between climate targets set by European oil and gas companies versus their American counterparts? I can uh, jump in there. Uh, I think, you know, I'll spell out um, maybe what was being alluded to, which is there is a stark difference between what American companies are doing and what companies around, energy companies around the world are doing. Um, namely, I think it's, it is uh, unfortunate to see that some of the American companies have yet to lay out any long-term targets for their emissions reductions or actually set out any sort of emission reductions that are non-intensity based emission reductions. So both Exxon and Chevron both have made voluntary climate commitments, but both of them are based on emission intensity reductions and not overall emission reductions, which doesn't hold them accountable to actually reducing pollution at all. They could you know, expand production, um, but have less, uh, less pollution at per, per barrel of oil or per, per unit of gas. Um, while still increasing their overall pollution. So I would say that it's um, the, the biggest difference is, you know, companies like Shell and BP have made long-term targets uh, to be net zero by 2050. That's a step forward. Um, and I, you know, I, we're going to hold them accountable to that. But, uh, you know, the U.S. companies definitely have less uh, political pressure. And, and I think that's one of the reasons we're calling for the Biden administration to be strong in its policies, because clearly that does have an impact on what companies see as their, you know, what they are required to do and what they're going to do voluntarily. Can I just add that um, some, some of the promises I've seen by European companies are based on technology that just doesn't exist yet. So um, I think they're exaggerating some. Thank you both. Um, we do have another question coming in from Facebook and this question is for Sharon. Uh, the question asks, what do the recent failures of Texas energy during the last cold snap tell you about the ability of Texas lawmakers to protect us from the climate crisis? I watched hours and hours of a hearing um, all, the, all day long and way into the night and what I saw were a lot of lawmakers making excuses for the upstream oil and gas industry and blaming it on the power plants. And that's the end of the problem. They need to start at the beginning of the problem. And there's just, the political will in Texas does not exist. And that's why I think Biden, President Biden needs to uh, have the EPA reassess the Clean Air Act implementation by Texas and revoke it. Thank you. I'm gonna put out one last call for questions from folks on Zoom. If you have a question for the panel um, and are watching this via Zoom, please go ahead and enter that question into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And if you are watching us on Facebook Live and would like to ask a question of the panel, please go ahead and leave any questions as a comment in the live stream. And we will do our best to, to field that. So last chance for questions. Great. 
Um, it looks like those are all of the questions that we have at this time. Um, I am going to turn it back over to Josh for just a quick closing remark. I just wanted to, to thank everyone for, for being here, for, for joining us. Um, this is a big moment. Uh, this is a time where we need to, to really look at the commitments and ask ourselves, is this enough to actually tackle the climate problem we have ahead? What is the rule of corporate accountability and responsibility? What is the rule of government? What is the rule of people on the ground? Um, and you know, I think I'm, I'm glad that we're all here having that conversation. Um, but you know, what we're here to say is that the first step needs to be a commitment to cutting methane pollution by 65% by using the Clean Air Act. It's a simple ask. It's within the, the rules and within the laws. And, um, and you know, we're all on board with it. And we're hoping that we can see government support and corporate support for this as well. So thanks for, for joining us. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to either like Kelly, right? Or, or Lauren or myself. Um, I'm sure our emails will be provided in a follow-up. Um, yeah, we're uh, very happy. Although, is this a question that just came through? Yeah, there is actually. Yeah, I'll jump in here. Um, thanks, Adam. And uh, for that question, we will be sharing a video of the event today. And it's also up on the Earthworks Facebook page, as well as the Moms Clean Air Force Facebook page. But we will be in touch with a link to the recording as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.